So we're, I'm pleased to introduce Andrea Navarro from American Student Assistance. If any of you were at uh, any of our financial aid trainings over the past year, you've uh, seen Andrea in, in live in person. She's wonderful. She has a lot of great knowledge about helping students who are undocumented and all the issues related to admissions and financial aid. She's a wealth of knowledge. So we're excited to have her here to present this webinar. For those of you who are hoping to get a PDP point for this webinar, it is worth one PDP point. So we will um, send you the links to the evidence of learning forms after the webinar, in addition to the PowerPoint if you want to collect those PDPs. At any time during the webinar, feel free to ask questions via the chat feature. I'll be monitoring those questions as we go and stopping periodically so that Andrea can answer some of those questions. You are all on mute, so if you're trying to chat with us verbally, we won't be able to hear you, so feel free to use that chat feature. And with all the housekeeping details out of the way, I want to turn the mic over to Andrea from ASA and, and we'll get started. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here again. My name is Andrea Navarro. I work at the College Planning Center at American Student Assistance based out of Boston, Massachusetts. I've been there for about five years. Um, and in the last five years, um, I've encountered dozens and dozens of undocumented and DACA families. Um, I started back in 2012 and I helped sort of the first wave of, of DACA families apply for DACA. And in the every year I've seen a, a tremendous increase in undocumented and DACA families. And so I've done a lot of research, talked to a lot of professionals, done conferences on this topic. And so my goal for you today is to Hold on one second, thank you. My goal is to provide all of you with a really solid base with which to tackle this incredibly complicated subject. So I'm only with you for about an hour. I know it's gonna be so hard to get give you all of the details, but hopefully this will give you a really good background, whether you're an educator, a high school counselor, or a college access professional. It's a little bit for everyone here. So I'm gonna start with some definitions and status descriptions. This is so important because we wanna make sure we as practitioners understand exactly what makes up an undocumented student. In the last five years, the most common questions I usually get is, is this student even undocumented? So I want to make sure we address who is and who isn't. Then we'll go through some federal, state, and institutional policies for financial aid. Um, and then I'll, you know, try to share with you some specific strategies and opportunities for your students. So not only give you the information, but also give you some tools. And then, of course, some resources. Um, like Stephanie said, we'll take questions in chunks throughout. So hopefully you have a lot of those. I love questions. So without f further ado, let's go on here. So the differences in immigration status. So when we talk about undocumented, we need to make sure we know what a documented student is. And so someone who is documented, and I'm basing this a little bit on um, the federal financial aid eligibility um, but statuses, but it's a great way to sort of in your mind frame who is documented and who is undocumented. So a documented student is a U.S. citizen or national. They're also U.S. permanent residents. And the third category is eligible non-citizens. So you'll see these funny numbers after the U.S. permanent resident. These correspond, the I-551 especially, correspond to applications the students and families will file with USCIS. So USCIS is the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Agency, part of the federal government. So these are all the different types of designations given to permanent residents. Now you can see here this little green flag. I put this in as a visual for you to remember that U.S. permanent residents and then the third category, eligible non-citizens, which we'll go through, these are permanent resident card holders, green card holders. So colloquially known as the green card, right? So all of these um, people will have a permanent resident card green card, and a social security number. So what is this huge eligible non-citizens category? So obviously we know citizens and we know permanent residents, but who are these eligible non-citizens? And so it is these 
designations. So the I-94, it's an arrival departure record. It's given out by Homeland Security, USCIS, and it's this whole huge category that sometimes we don't know about, but the the I-94 holders actually also receive a permanent resident card or a green card. So they're on an even playing field as those permanent residents, even though they're not permanent residents. So they're given an I-94. Usually it's because they've been granted asylum or they've um, been paroled into the U.S. for at least one year. Now this parole does not mean that they've done something wrong with um, you know, the law, broken the law. It just means that USCIS and Department of Homeland Security is sort of watching them for a year. Um, they're given an I-94 record, a green card, and if everything goes well after a year, then they can apply for um, further status. Refugees, now this is a huge category for us right now. So the asylees and refugees status granted, those will get an I-94 as well. Battered immigrants, conditional entrance, and Cuban Haitian entrance. The conditional and Cuban Haitian entrance, this is an older category. We saw this much more in the 80s and 90s. Um, so right now, the asylum granted and refugee are the big ones. Now the T visa. The T visa is the only visa currently that is um, eligible for federal financial aid, victims of human trafficking. Now, if we go on to the next category, you'll see that these are some other documented statuses, okay, but they're not eligible for federal financial aid. So, notice the blue flag. So, the blue flag denotes that they actually get employment authorization cards, not the same thing as a green card. So, still completely documented, still, you know, here legally, get a social security number, can work, but they only get the employment authorization card, not the green card. So, as you can see, Everyone in this category, the other documented statuses include family unity status, temporary residence, and then all the other non-immigrant visas. Um, so the non-immigrant visas are a little bit different. They don't get an employment authorization card, but they are here legally. So work visas, student visas, tourist visas. Now the last category, TPS, is temporary protective status. TPS holders get employment authorization cards and a social security number, okay? And I'm going to clump this into um, DACA because these type of students often face the same hurdles. They're not eligible for federal financial aid, okay? And sometimes they're not even eligible for in-state tuition. So it's a tough category to be in. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with TPS status, but um, the the USCIS, the federal government, sort of um, grants this TPS to certain countries every year, and after a period of um, a few years, that TPS status can be renewed, um, potentially. Um, for further detail and information on specific status concerns, I really love the Federal Student Aid Handbook, and I've included the, um, the link here. Volume 1, Chapter 2 particularly is great if you want to get more information about all these documented statuses and sort of the, the nuances between them. Now, you notice the last one on here is DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. We're going to talk about this a lot. Um, and I put this slide in, this, um, in this slide to give you the knowledge that DACA students also get the Employment Authorization Card. But they're a little bit different than TPS. They're not entirely documented yet. So a little bit um, tricky there. Um, but let's move on, and then we'll also see if we have some questions. So um, one question is, why would they be watched if they didn't commit a crime just because they are an immigrant? So this is the parole. So th it's, they're not exactly watched necessarily. So remember, this is not um, like they're put on some special watch list. This just means that um, in the port of departure or port of arrival, they have made their pres presence known to Department of Homeland Security. So after a year, Department of Homeland Security will, you know, check in with them to make sure that they've done everything right um, for their legal status. And so they can then upgrade potentially to a permanent resident card. So just make sure that they're doing everything they need to be doing. So they're not necessarily monitored. It's more of a check-in. 
All right, so next question. Can these students use this card? I'm thinking you're referring to the employment authorization card number to file for FAFSA. And we're going to go through this in later slides in a lot of detail, so I will make sure to answer this question. And the next one, are TPS students ever eligible for a green card? Unfortunately, no. But, and I'm going to go through this in a little bit more detail, I always urge my TPS students to renew their TPS um, way before it expires to make sure that they're, they've always got continuous residence status because you never know. The family might be able to consult with an immigration attorney and then realize that they're eligible for, for an upgrade or another type of status. So initially, once TPS is granted, it's not necessarily a pathway to citizenship, but it can potentially be upgraded. Um, if the family qualifies for something else down the road. All right, next slide. Thank you. So this, I kind of like this slide for its visuals. You can see here that the permanent resident card on the left, known as the green card, is predominantly green and blue. You'll see that it says um, permanent resident quite clearly up top. Here, and then this, the employment authorization card. You can see that it's blue and red, right? So this is not a green card. The employment authorization card is not a green card, but it does give um, the holders the ability to work and reside legally in the United States. So as a reminder, employment authorization cards are given to those who have um, TPS and DACA as well. Permanent resident cards are obviously given to permanent residents. Now the tricky piece about this is you'll notice that both of these cards have what's called a USCIS number. This is what um, is so hard sometimes with students because they come in um, often to me and say, hey, you know, I want to complete a FAFSA um, and I want to get loans and grants. And so they bring me an employment authorization card and it's really kind of heartbreaking to break it to them and say, hey, you know, this is awesome. It gives you great benefit. You can reside and work here, but unfortunately you're not eligible for financial aid. Now, the FAFSA asks for an A number. Now, to, keep, to sort of keep this um, clear, it's a little tricky. The A number used to refer to alien registration number. They quickly realized that that was a little bit politically incorrect. So um, USCIS changed it from A number to USCIS number, which is why you see that on the cards. These are newer cards. But the FAFSA still asks for the A number. Remember, FAFSA is through the um, Department of, of Student Aid, um, Federal Student Aid. It's not U USCIS. So the, the interesting thing about our government is that the different federal branches, branches don't really talk to one another. So that's why you see that discrepancy. That's why the cards say USCIS number, and that's why the um, FAFSA says A number. But it, they're really the same thing. So now that we've sort of covered in a lot of detail, um, hopefully I didn't go too quickly, who is a documented student? Let's take a little, um, little time to define who is a documented student. So by definition, an undocumented person is a foreign national who's entered the United States without inspection or with fraudulent documents. So that's the first category. <clears throat> and the second category is someone who entered legally as a non-immigrant but then sort of overstayed the terms of his or her status and remained in the United States without authorization. So you can see that there are two types of undocumented people. The first, you enter the U.S. with absolutely no documentation, no inspection, or with fraudulent documents. So you have absolutely no legal status from the moment that you enter the U.S. That's one category. The second, you enter legally as a non-immigrant, so maybe a tourist visa, a student visa, but you overstay the length of that permit. So that's the second. When we talk about DREAMers and DREAM Act and um, giving you know, certain young people a pathway to citizenship, when we advocate for that, that's mostly category number one. So those will be children who came in with no legal status through no, you know, no, through, it wasn't really their decision. So they came in and that's who they're um, trying to help with DACA and DREAM Act. But we'll go through a little bit of this in more detail later. But I just wanted to sort of give you those definitions. 
you can see here, I um, really like this slide because I think it makes the case for how important these discussions are, and I'm so glad that they're gaining much more national attention now versus four or five years ago. You can see here, we reckon that there are about 11 0.2 million undocumented immigrants of all ages living in the United States. Now, the, that's that we know of. Those are the people that potentially have um, self-reported or self-identified. I think, and many, well, many people think that the number is a lot, a lot larger. 2.1 million undocumented students in the United States potentially eligible for the proposed DREAM Act. Now, the DREAM Act hasn't passed, but out of the 11.2, 2.1 million undocumented students would be poten potentially eligible for that DREAM Act. So again, students who came in, no legal status, but were so young, could not have been of their own free will to do that. So they're, they're the ones that people are fighting to, to get at least a little bit of a pathway to citizenship. Now, it's staggering to me that 1.1 million undocumented children under the age of 18 are living in the United States right now. And of those 1.1 million, only 7,000, 7 to 13,000, are actually enrolling in college every year. That's unfathomable to me. That is just completely um, not acceptable. And so hopefully by having these webinars and hopefully by educating your peers, we'll be able to increase this number from 7,000 to something a little bit more um, reasonable compared to the 1.1 million. So a little bit on the DREAM Act, I mentioned that the DREAM Act hasn't passed and it hasn't. The DREAM Act um, originally began as a student movement back in the 90s. And so it's been around for a very long time. This conversation around immigration is not necessarily very new. And it stands for Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors. Now the DREAM Act would, in fact, help those 2.1 million um, young people, and I say young because it focuses on students, to gain a pathway to citizenship. Now that, that is the ideal. That has not happened. The DREAM Act has <clears throat> passed through Congress a few times and has been very, very close to passing, but it has never passed. So this is still something that a lot of student movements um, on college campuses and in high schools and a lot of organizations are still fighting for. But I wanted to introduce this because we often refer to students who got DACA as dreamers, and that's technically the right term, but we have to be careful um, to really define what their status is. So they're dreamers, but they have DACA. Um, a lot of times I have family say, hey, you know, help me get go to college. I have I have the Dream Act. And I always, you know, I say I say great, but I do correct them and say, hey, listen, you have DACA. Let's keep fighting for the Dream Act. It's really important to empower students and empower families to also um, have a voice in in this struggle. Um, so I always try to make sure that we have the terms right. So what exactly is DACA? We've heard a lot, and I'm, I'm so glad for the timing of this webinar, because I think with, with what's happen, happening in Washington right now, a lot of us are, are very concerned about the future of DACA. But to give you a little background, DACA is an immigration policy. It was an executive action um, presented by um, President Obama in 2012. So as an executive action, it did not go through Congress. It was him that signed this, and as such, can be taken away at any time. This is what's so frightening about DACA. It's an amazing, teeny tiny victory. I always call DACA maybe five to ten percent of what the Dream Act could be. It's a it's a little bit of a victory, but it can be taken away at any time. It's an executive action, and so what we know now um, is that during <coughs> his campaign, President Elect Trump said he would end DACA. This is very scary for a lot of our students. Right now, we're not sure if and when that would happen. Okay, so he has promised he would end it, but we have gotten no details as of now. We do know that DACA is in place at least until January 19th, which is obviously when um, he, he would be inaugurated. So DACA has allowed certain undocumented immigrants who entered the country before their 16th birthday and before June 2007 to receive a renewable work permit. They're exempt 
from deportation as well. So it's not a legal status. It mostly is um, like a little Band-Aid to exempt them from deportation. So you can see it's not an entire documented status they've been given. They've just been given sort of a little bit of um, a break from being deported. They receive a work permit, which is pretty huge for them, um, and a social security card. So when asked before, you know, in the last three or four years, should my student, should my son or daughter apply for DACA, I've always said yes, they have to. This is a huge benefit. Having a work permit um, will at least enable them to, to be employed. And so that's sort of what's been happening, but a lot will continue to change um, with the new administration. So. Um, let's move on and then please continue to send us your questions. This is um, just obviously a very um, tricky subject, so I want to make sure it's as clear as possible for everyone. So in the past, um, in order to apply for DACA, um, they have to file an application with USCIS. Um, they have to mail in the application. It would cost them $465 to do so. You can see that's a, that's a large amount of money for a lot of families. Um, I've ha I always use this example because it, it has stuck with me. I, I had um, a family actually come to me and say, you know, is it okay for me to, for us to just apply for one child? We can't afford to have all three apply for DACA. So they literally had to choose who they would um, give DACA to first. It's heartbreaking. You can see it's not an easy process. Um, now, some of you may be asking, well, isn't it risky for someone who's undocumented to go through this process, self-identify, and give their information over to USCIS? And in the past, I had said, no. It's not necessarily risky because they, President Obama's administration has said that the information that is, that is provided on these forms would not be used against them in a court of law or to be deported. And in fact, could serve as a benefit if ever there was something like the DREAM Act that um, came to fruition, it would serve as a benefit for them to already have DACA and to be in the system and to show that they've been eagerly, you know, um, complying with, with certain applications and, it, and everything is in order. Things are looking a little different for our students now, um, and I will go into what, um, what we're hearing they should or should not do for, um, regarding DACA. So what we know now as of December 2016, so this is obviously very time sensitive, USCIS will continue to process DACA first-time applications and renewals. Okay, they will continue, obviously. They haven't said that they're going to stop. But I have heard from a lot of different um, immigrant coalitions and a lot of different attorneys I've talked to that it's advisable that the students renew, or they're urged to renew before January 2016 if they've already been granted DACA. So if a student already has DACA, they're urged to renew as soon as possible to make sure they get in before um, January 2016. But if there are students who don't have DACA and want to have DACA, I would not necessarily advise them to apply after January 2016. There are too many unknowns of the new administration, and we don't want to put students at risk with sharing too much information um, if we are not certain that DACA will continue past January 2016, if that makes sense. So to recap, if someone already has DACA, they're urged to renew before January 2016, so in, within the next few weeks. If they're a first-time um, DACA applicant, I would advise them to wait a little bit until they, we know exactly what uh, President-elect Trump is going to do regarding DACA. Now let's pause right here and take a few questions. Um, oh, sorry, yes, January 2017. Absolutely, thank you for correcting me. I apologize about that. Um, so yes, January 20, um, 2017, as in literally, you know, six, seven weeks from now. What about, so I have a question about some adults. I'm working with some ESOL adults that would like to go to college. All of this still applies. Um, all of the undocumented student information still applies to adults. The only thing that wouldn't apply to adults is DACA. So we are going to spend a little time now talking about DACA, but other um, information I'm going to share with you will still apply to the adults. 
Um, and then I have another question. Does DACA give college students non-eligible resident status, thus FA Pell eligibility? No. So DACA is not a uh, documented status. It's not eligible for federal financial aid. All DACA does is give them an exemption from deportation, give them a work authorization, and a social security number with which to file taxes. So very limited benefits, um, but for a lot of students it's better than nothing. All right. Um, so last question now, how are you instructing parents who may need to apply for an, um, an ITIN, that's um, the number in order to file taxes? Is it advisable to have them do this right now? Absolutely. Um, and the ITIN is, a, is different from DACA. It's a number, not an a, not a exemption from deportation. So I would say that for now, have them do it as soon as possible, but it's not as time sensitive as DACA. So the ITIN will continue to function like it always has unless there are some you know, huge amendments to the tax code. I don't foresee the, um, that happening. So yeah, continue to, to have people apply for that. I know a lot of undocumented um, immigrants who, who do file their taxes, and it's advisable because if there ever was a, a um, a chance for them to get a pathway to citizenship, it's great for USCIS to see that they've been contributing in that positive way and it bodes well for, for their status in their case. Now the second piece of advice that I would give students and families is to get, and this goes for adult students as well, is to get screened for other immigration offices, um, options via a reputable immigration clinic or a nonprofit legal service provider. I can't tell you how many students I've worked with in the past who come in and out of fear just haven't, have never asked what their options might be. And so when we sort of con, uh, connect them to a, uh, maybe a nonprofit legal service provider, a lot of, um, a lot of immigrant coalitions um, in different states have walk-in hours with um, pro bono attorneys. These are all amazing um, resources for a lot of undocumented students because they can go in, they have a few minutes to tell them, um, tell these um, attorneys their story and to see if they might be eligible or qualify for any other status. And you'd be surprised for how many families might end up qualifying for other statuses like asylum or refugee. And with a, um, with a really reputable, um, even a nonprofit um, legal service provider attorney, they might be able to get that done. And so sometimes undocumented families might have a chance to, to um, move their status along, but they just have never even asked. And so that's why we always recommend to get screened um, for other immigration op um, options. I do have to warn, and USCIS warns as well, against scams. Um, I work a lot in the Boston area and its surrounding communities. Um, and we know, of course, that um, different communities um, that speak different languages you know, are very close-knit, and sometimes they might um, be the perfect sort of um, targets for different scams. Different organizations, even within their own communities, might advertise, hey, come here for legal services. We'll charge, you know, for a fee of $100. Any type of screening that they get, they should go directly to a reputable immigration <laughs> clinic or nonprofit legal service providers. You'd be surprised how many scams there are out there, um, and we don't want our families and our adult students to go through that. I've included two great resources here. Um, Educators for Fair Consideration has published a very recently um, sort of a fact sheet about um, the current status of the immigration debate and what we might expect. I've touched upon it here a little bit, but consult these resources for greater detail. Now the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, they have these amazing handouts, uh, printable PDFs in English and Spanish about the presidential transition that you might um, want to look at, and it's a great resource for families as well. I've had in the last few um, last few weeks just a ton of calls from families, and I've, um, you know, sent them these PDFs to sort of have them read through it and be just very in the know about their rights. Um, now, I do have to... Um, urge you to sort of communicate this to your families and students that they do have rights. As undocumented individuals, you know, what we've been hearing, the rhetoric we've been hearing with the current presidential um, sort of discourse is that we have to get illegal people out. Well, as undocumented um, 
adults and students, they do still have rights. And so what we know now is that if these families are ever put in a situation where they have to interact with immigration agents, you know, they don't have to speak to anyone. They don't have to open the door or p to police or agents unless the, they can, the agents can procure a legal document with their name on it. Ask, you know, half the families ask to slip it under the door to verify. You know, things like that. Um, these toolkits on these resources, um, these two links will give you sort of PDFs that you can print out for families. I know I make it sound very scary, and it's not as scary here in Massachusetts, but um, the situations can change very drastically from state to state. So it's, it's um, vital that we all stay informed about rights of undocumented um, students and adults. So let's um, turn to um, a little bit on admissions. And now this, um, I know we had a question earlier about um, adult students. All of this applies to an undocumented individual of any age. So what I'm about to tell you does not necessarily only apply to those who are 16 or 17 and are more traditional college age. Okay? So, what is the actual policy on admissions? And as of now, there is actually no federal law that prohibits the admission of undocu undocumented immigrants to U.S. colleges. Federal state laws do not require students to prove citizenship in order to enter private U.S. institutions of higher education. Okay, so some public campuses, it's really important to make the distinction between um, private schools and public campuses. Some public campuses do have different po differing policies. Okay, so hopefully th this um, the next few slides will clarify that a little bit. So a question I often get, which is why I added this slide today, is what's the difference between an international student and undocumented student for admissions? And the difference is that international students will be required a J-1 or F-1 visa. So an international student will usually be someone who completed high school in another country and now wants to pursue college in the United States. There's a separate application process usually for international students. And as a lot of you might know, you have to show a bank statement as proof of affordability for a J-1 or F-1 visa. As an undocumented student, I always urge my students to self-identify to the admissions offices because if they don't self-identify as undocumented, a lot of these admissions offices at private schools especially will assume they're international. So they'll start the J-1 or F-1 visa process, and that's not what the undocumented students um, need to go through. The same application as domestic students. So a lot of our undocumented students, if they finished high school in the United States, will be considered domestic for admissions. This is really important to know. Um, and for some of the adult students, if they finished high school in another country, that, that if they can get um, sort of um, a translation of their diploma and an equivalency statement from some of the um, different agencies like WES or CED, that's almost as good as um, being considered a domestic student. Now, uh, another question I always get um, about self-identifying to admissions offices is, well, isn't that risky? And a lot of my students, you know, there's a lot of fear that comes with being undocumented, a lot of anxiety that's really tough to deal with at any age. And so they often ask, well, if I tell st schools that I'm undocumented, will I be deported? The answer is absolutely no. Because of FERPA laws, because of other um, systems in place, the schools will never out a student they will never report a student, especially private schools. And that's really important for our students to know. Um, even if they file a FAFSA, for example, that's through the department, that's through student aid, they will not be reported. So the different agencies are not talking to each other. So uh, the student, um, the financial aid office is not going to then call um, federal student aid, and then federal student aid is then not going to call DHS. That's never happened. I've never heard of it happening. Um, so that's that's something that um, hopefully has answered some of your um, your questions coming into it. Um, let's let's maybe this might be a good moment to see, check if we have questions or. I actually have a question, Andrea. When s it's a little more specific, when students are actually filling out the admissions application. Yeah. 
what should they check when they get to this part that asks about citizenship, um, you, you know, country of origin, those sorts of detailed questions? That's a really good question, Stephanie. So the Common App will have, um, it's not as um, user-friendly as, as I would like it to be for undocumented students, but you can um, check off international, and then I would advise to always contact the admissions office directly and let them know that directly. And this kind of um, leads me to my next point on this slide, and I'll touch um, upon it briefly before we take more questions, is that when a student or family is calling the admissions office to let them know, it is crucial, completely vital, that they connect with someone in the admissions office who works with multicultural students or international students to ask about scholarship opportunities, but to also get a more empathetic ear. I had um, a student last year call the admissions office and get very quickly discouraged when she talked to the person that answered the front desk and the person had no idea what she was talking about when she said I'm undocumented and so um, the you know my student hung up came to me crying and saying you know they just don't understand and so then it was up to us to sort of research okay let's call back but who at this office has at least worked with some international students it's so important to empower your students to talk to those special people at the different offices some um, campuses will be more undocu friendly we call them more friendly toward the undocumented students than others but you'd be surprised how many campuses as of late are catching up to this and I'd love to um, answer the rest of the questions now so the first question can students apply for an international student visa as an undocumented student after they've been accepted to college you will find that it's really tough for undocumented students to apply for international student visas because they will not qualify. An international student visa has very specific parameters about who can apply. And most of those parameters include you have to live internationally. <laughs> so someone who is undocumented is living domestically. So it's going to be very hard for them to prove they're living in another country. So that's something that's, that's the first hurdle. Secondly, they have to provide a statement of income. Um, they have to have at least a certain amount of money in the bank for them to be issued a student visa. This is assuming, you know, the normal um, international student, you know, is coming from a different country. Family might have some means. They have to prove that they have the means to reside in the United States without being able to work, right? Because international students can't work in the United States. So they have to show that they have money in the, in the bank for them to be issued a federal, um, sorry, an F-1 visa. So that's something that's another hurdle for a lot of undocumented students is that some families just don't have that much money um, in the bank account, you know, 50,000, 75,000. And so they also have to provide a lot of information about their families living abroad. And so if your family's also domestic and undocumented in the United States, there's just no way to fill that out correctly. Next question. Um, anything like DACA for minors arriving after June 2007? This is, thank you, Christina, for this question. This is a great question. You will see that the one big flaw of DACA is that you have to have arrived before June 2007. So that leaves out everyone else. Everyone else that came into the country after 2007. And unfortunately, I'm just so sad to report there's nothing available for the students who came after or who don't meet DACA requirements. And so you can see that even if it was an amazing little victory for some people in 2012 when President Obama gave this executive action, it's still a flawed executive action because eventually, if DACA isn't... Um, doesn't go away, there, it will still eventually go away in the sense that people will stop being able to qualify for it. The pool of eligible DACA recipients will eventually run out. And so however you look at it, it's not a fix-all. We need more comprehensive immigration reform, I think. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we're going to move on to um, continue with the PowerPoint because I know we want to wrap up around 11 so folks can get back to work. Uh, so we'll answer one more question, then we'll keep going. Is there a better wording for students to use? Where do they write it um, to self-identify? Okay, so this is interesting because um, 
they don't really necessarily have to or need to write it on the admissions application unless there is a, a an institutional form that they can type into. Uh, a really um, important thing to do especially for some private schools that require the CSS profile and that will be able to fund some of that um, and give them some institutional aid is to self-identify in the CSS profile in the special circumstances and explanations section of the CSS profile. Um, we'll, go, we'll continue the PowerPoint. Hopefully, I'll continue to answer this question. Um, so institutional policies. So we know that for a lot of public campuses, institutional aid might be limited. But for private campuses, it can be a really good um, option for a lot of your um, higher achieving students to apply to certain undocu-friendly private schools that have a lot of institutional aid and are need blind. Um, secondly, be honest about immigration status, okay? I know I already said this, but colleges are prohibited from releasing information unless they're under court order. Um, so do not ever um, stop a student of any age from applying to a school because they're undocumented. This is, I think, if you get one thing out of this PowerPoint, it's that we need to really be empowering our students and creating very safe spaces for them to be able to um, pursue their dreams. Um, and I'll move on quickly. So let's start talking a little bit about financial aid. So you can see here, um, this is sort of um, by state. So you can see the differences in the country regarding financial aid. So let's look first at California. So California is sort of the golden child for immigration, state immigration reform. Not only does California offer in-state tuition for undocumented students, they also offer financial aid at public campuses. This is great. This is unheard of. This is amazing. So this is what I think we all should be aiming for. But not every state is there yet. Um, you can see here that the gray states have no law granting in-state tuition to undocumented students. So that's a hurdle for a lot of our Massachusetts students here because having TPS or DACA um, might not necessarily um, grant them a certain benefits. You can see here that the blue states, dark blue, they're sort of at the other end of the spectrum. They ban enrollment at public campuses altogether. This is obviously very extreme. This map is from 2013. As of 2015, Georgia has then sort of stepped back from that um, banning enrollment and they they have sort of stepped back and said, okay, we'll ban enrollment at only certain campuses, not all of them. So you can see that there's different um, different levels of undocu-friendliness here. So Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we do not offer in-state tuition to undocumented students. This is what makes it so tough for us. But DACA students do get in-state tuition. This is important to note. So this is why I'm encouraging and I've always encouraged DACA students to apply and we know now that um, they should in fact renew as soon as possible to keep getting in-state tuition in Massachusetts. Now this is a step in the right direction. It's, it could be better in Massachusetts, but at least it's something. Now I do want to note the in-state tuition benefit is for DACA. Somehow, TPS students have been left out of this a little bit. And this is something that a lot of us have been sort of um, advocating for at different public campuses. But for some reason, DACA students, they're shooing for in-state tuition since this order came out a few years ago, but TPS students are still in the gray zone. And remember, TPS, stu TPS students are documented. They have an um, employment work authorization card and a social. So if any of you work in different state agencies or um, you know have these conversations, always push to give TPS students um, some recognition and benefits at the public level. I think it's, it's vital for, for a lot of these students. TPS countries include Honduras, El Salvador, some African countries. Um, so there, TPS is much more common than, than some of us think. 
So how to get the in-state tuition benefit. So if you have um, students who get DACA or who have DACA or are in the process of renewing DACA, they do get in-state tuition at public campuses. I have called all of the different public campuses in Massachusetts, and if you're joining us from a different state, I encourage you to um, check out what's going on in your state regarding in-state tuition. But in Massachusetts, <coughs> if someone is DACA, they can provide um, oh, sorry, the numbering is a little off on this slide. I apologize. A copy of their USCIS letter received in the mail that confirms their DACA status. So this USCIS letter will be called a notice of action. This notice of action confirms that their DACA was approved. This is the I-797C form. Some schools will, will need this letter as well as a copy of their social security card as well as a copy of their work authorization card. Remember that blue and red card. Some schools need all three. Some schools need two. Some schools just need one of these things. So you, you're noticing a pattern of me saying call the admissions office to make sure and to verify what that admissions office needs. If you have a student applying to Salem State University, have them call the Salem State admissions office and ask someone there who's qualified to sort of answer this for them. What exactly do you need in order for me to benefit from my in-state tuition um, benefit? I am DACA. And you'll be surprised how many schools give slightly different answers, but it will be a combination of these three things. So encourage your families to always keep all the letters they receive from USCIS. Keep them in a safe place, make some copies. You never know when um, it'll come in handy. So what does this mean for, for the financial aid applications? So for FAFSA, only students with a Social Security may apply for FAFSA. We know this. You need a um, social security number to be the student on the FAFSA that is applying for financial aid. But because DACA and TPS students do have social security numbers, they can in fact fill out a FAFSA. Okay? Now, the FAFSA, we know that for public campuses or for federal financial aid, they're not going to get Pell Grants or loans. So then you might ask, why, sh why should they even fill out a FAFSA? They can, but they're not going to get any federal funds from it. Well, I say <laughs> you never know what institutional aid they might be able to get from the campuses, as well as some private scholarships need a student aid report to um, determine their need. So the FAFSA is a great way for the family to have that um, recap of their finances for private scholarships. I've had a lot of DACA students apply for scholarships needing a student aid report. So they have filled out a FAFSA even though they can't get federal funds. They have printed out the student aid report and sent it to these private scholarships to get their money. Now if a student filling out FAFSA has one or two undocumented parents, the student has the social, they might be DAC or TPS, they can still fill out a FAFSA. The parents don't have socials, they can insert all zeros in lieu of a social security number and then instead of um, applying for an FSA ID to sign the FAFSA, the parents can then print out a signature form and mail it into um, federal student aid. So it's a slightly longer process, but students with undocumented parents can still fill out a FAFSA, okay, and the parents can still sign. I have even a lot of students who are citizens who might have undocumented parents, and that, that should not be a barrier to fill out a FAFSA. Now for CSS profile, encourage all your students to apply for the CSS profile. You know that the CSS profile is for um, institutional aid only, so a lot of the schools that require the CSS profile have some institutional money to, to give out. So encourage your students, especially your undocumented ones, to fill out a CSS profile if the school needs it and to be honest about their immigration status in the, um, the section, the explanation and special circumstances section where they can type in. And we'll move on to some questions. And I want to be sensitive of your time, so um, we'll try to do this quickly. All right, so the question is, some colleges require students to fill out the FAFSA to receive any institutional aid. Are we recommending students to file FAFSA even though they are not able to receive federal aid? Absolutely, Andrea. So I hope I answered that question in the, um, in the previous slide. Yes, we encourage them to fill out a FAFSA because um, 
especially DACA and TPS students, they have a social, so they can. Undocumented students who have nothing obviously cannot fill out a FAFSA. And this is why with our undocumented students that don't have DACA or TPS, we have to be um, really creative and maybe um, have explore different options for funding their schools using private scholarships or go to certain schools that might offer them institutional aid. But for those that can fill out a FAFSA, they absolutely should. And remember, federal student aid is not going to report them to DHS or, you know, ICE or whatever, you know, um, scary names um, have been popping up. They, that's never really happened ever. Okay. So let's quickly go over, um, and I'm going to take just a few minutes to do this, some strategies. So for those of you that um, are working with um, undocumented adults even, or just um, students of any age, um, I really want to make the case for um, a certificate program. Um, a lot of my undocumented students, while they're waiting um, to get screened or maybe waiting for a different status, they can go ahead and, and finish a certificate while they're waiting for those statuses to come through potentially. And that way, you know, they, they do have some earning potential with a certificate. So I do encourage some undocumented students to start off with a certificate because those credits mo more than um, likely will also be stackable. So if they want to go back in a few years, finish out their associates, and then finish out their bachelors, they can. Um, but do make the case for a certificate with certain students. The second piece is to complete a degree as quickly and cheaply as possible. We know that on average, um, on average students lose about 12 to 13 credits in the transfer process. Now this is overall citizen, permanent resident, you name it, any student, this is the average. They lose 13 credits in the transfer process going from associates to bachelor's degree. You can imagine this is a problem for any student citizen or not. It's even more of an issue with our undocumented population. They cannot afford to lose 13 credits, especially when they're paying higher prices. So something to keep in mind, you know, losing 13 credits can cost you about $7,000 when you think about um, a typical community college credit here in Massachusetts. So something to keep in mind um, when you're advising some um, undocumented students is to really map out their credits Talk about those long-term goals, you know, and talk about what credits you need to get in your associates that will, you know, transfer into a bachelor. So kind of mapping out that long-term goal, goal is much more crucial for this population than ever. The third strategy, especially for those working with students in high schools, is to utilize some of these programs. All of these programs will um, make... Um, their college credits shorter and cheaper. So for example, dual, dual enrollment. Um, you have to check um, some dual enrollment policies. I know, for example, Malden High School has a dual enrollment program with Bunker Hill Community College, but for a long time you had to have um, had some citizenship status for that. So always check what the dual enrollment agreement is um, particularly if the dual enrollment agreement is with a public school. But for some um, private universities that have dual enrollment programs, mo more, more often than not, do not have any citizenship requirements. I've had students do dual enrollment and leave high school with 9 or 12 um, college credits. So especially for undocumented students, this is really, really crucial. Also, AP classes, CLEP exams. So CLEP is through College Board. And there are exams you can take to receive college credit in certain um, fields. So, for example, I had a student who um, maybe, um, you know, didn't speak English so well in her junior year, but was just excellent at math. And so just because someone might not speak English very well doesn't mean they can't take some CLEP exams or do some dual enrollment opportunities, especially the CLEP. She ended up taking CLEP in math and Spanish and ended up getting six college credits before she left um, high school. You have to remember K-12 through education is free for everyone. Plyler versus Stowe, that reminds us that anyone, regardless of immigration status, is 
eligible for a free K-12 education in the United States. So why not be creative with our undocumented students and maximize their K-12 years, especially their junior and senior years, to get as many college credits as they can before they even start college. So that's some, sometimes overlooked, um, but I really want to make sure that you all keep that in mind as well. So then just a little bit more about dual and concurrent enrollment. I encourage you to check policies at your individual towns and schools, but it could be a phenomenal opportunity for so many of our undocumented students. Um, here are some scholarship opportunities that I have found. Um, you know, I think a lot of them seem like they're geared toward the Hispanic population, but you'd be surprised. Some of these, you know, Latino college dollars, MALDEF, scholarships for Hispanics, even if your student is not Hispanic, because we know their undocumented students are more than just Hispanic students, I do still encourage everyone to check out these websites because they might have um, just great links to other scholarship op opportunities that are for more than just Hispanic students. 1,000 Degrees, I love this last one, and then Act on a Dream at Harvard College. They have a really great um, scholarship database as well for all undocumented students. I do encourage also um, students who, to look at just general scholarship databases because if they don't have, um, uh, you know, in their, under their eligibility criteria, if they don't have citizenship status listed, they're free to apply. So stay creative, don't give up. The scholarship search for undocumented students can be a little bit more lengthy, but if they start early, it's not impossible. And more and more organizations are noticing that there's a lack of funding for undocumented students and a lot of them are stepping up. I've noticed it just in the last 6 to 12 months. So this is not an exhaustive list of course and you'll have access to this um, to this after the presentation. All right and then just a few last resources. Um, the College Board has a pretty good section for their four professionals page geared through K-12 through counselors. This is not as complete as I would love it to be, but they're always adding to it. The National Immigration Law Center tracks activities related to state funding for higher, um, higher education for undocumented students, so I encourage you to Google them and look through that. And then if you live in Massachusetts, I cannot speak more highly of the MIRA Coalition. They're the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Coalition. And why I love them so much is because they offer free legal aid and immigration clinics. This is the type of immigration um, help that we should be um, kind of pushing our students and families to pursue. It's free. Um, these immigration clinics are very open, very warm and welcoming, and that's what we need to um, empower our families to do and get screened. And then lastly, um, you can see uh, I've just given just three more, U.S. Department of Ed um, under President Obama um, released this actually um, last year and this was groundbreaking when it came out supporting undocumented youth resource guide. I suggest you open this and download it as soon as possible. We're not sure if it's going to continue to be up um, after January. And then the last one, United We Dream um, and the um, SIM. So United We Dream is the student movement. It's the National Student Network and I um, really advise you to encourage your students of any age to join United We Dream. Their website is phenomenal. It's um, updated constantly and then the local chapter of it is SIM, the student immigrant movement. And so for a lot of students who are undocumented, I have seen this just be amazing for them, for it gives them um, just a place to voice their concerns, find that moral support with um, their peers, and just been a great um, help for a lot of my students. Again, I can't, we didn't really go over the emotional health and emotional and mental health of undocumented students. Um, I wanted to give you more facts, but we can't not talk about that. And so I think connecting students to the local chapters with other undocumented or DACA students is crucial. And SIM also provides some legal help for students. So if the students end up getting, um, you know, um, maybe DACA and you never know, maybe there's they need some legal help or they've um, encountered some legal trouble with their process, SIM can step up and sort of be that network of help for the student. So that's about it. Um, let me go through the last few questions to see if um, 
there's something that I haven't addressed, this is my contact information. Feel free to email me at any time, anavarro at asa.org. Um, I'm just eager to answer your questions and to continue the dialogue. So let's um, answer the last three questions. So um, it says, anything for Brazilian students? So Tiara, hello, how are you? Um, I, I think that you can look through a lot of the different websites I gave you and then there will always be sort of the local chapters that um, that um, sort of support different types of communities. So we have obviously the, the Spanish speaking community is really large but I have seen a lot of um, groups especially through SIM who a lot of um, Brazilian students um, sort of go to SIM and they sort of create their own networks and have access to a lot of resources. So if you're thinking of a particular student who's Brazilian, I would say do connect them to SIM. I can't stop raving about um, the great work that they do. Great. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> so we are going to take a couple more questions. If you have a question, feel free to send that in as we're wrapping up. Uh, just for those of you who are asking, we will be providing a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recording after the webinar once we get it all up on our website. So you will be able to get that. If you do need a certificate of attendance to um, use with your PDP points or for your supervisor, please email me directly, Stephanie Wells, swells at mifa.org. You will be getting an email from me that you can respond to that has the PowerPoint um, if, you, if you didn't catch my email. And we'd be happy to provide you a certificate of attendance if you do need that. Um, so if you do have a last question, feel free to send it in now. Uh, we're we're going to open it up for just another minute or two to let, give you all a minute just to uh, type in your questions. And while we're waiting for new questions, I do want to thank Andrea for attending. Uh, great paced webinar, great information. Those are some of the comments we're getting. So thank you for the positive feedback. And uh, you know, we'll I'm sure have her back again. Mm -hmm. um, so my email is Stephanie Wells. So it's S Wells, S W E L L S at MIFA.org. And I am going to type it in the chat feature as well so that you have that. And I will also type in my direct phone number if you need to get in touch with me. Okay. So just going through the questions here to see if we have any other questions. Okay, we're going to leave it open for one more minute. So if you have a question, feel free to uh, type that in. And I do want to encourage um, everyone who might need a little time to digest. This was a lot of information um, in a short amount of time. I do encourage you to email me at any time, anavarro at asa.org. You can also see my, um, my direct line is 617-867-8638. I'm in constant contact with a lot of um, my presentation participants. Um, it's really important to keep the dialogue going. I'm constantly learning myself, so if you have a tricky scenario, um, I'd be happy to work um, through it with you as well. Um, so Vanessa asked me, will you be attending the 2007 con Congressman Moulton immigration meeting? I have heard about it. I have not thought of attending, but now that you mention it, I will try to be there. Um, I have to look at the dates um, to see if I, I can go. But thank you, Vanessa, for the heads up on that. I really appreciate it. Okay, folks. We don't see any other questions coming in. Again, we will be providing the PowerPoint and the recording of the webinar, which is worth one PDP point if you need to, uh, if you're collecting PDP points and if you need a certificate of attendance, feel free to email me. So again, we want to thank Andrea for coming today and providing this great information. Uh, stay tuned as things progress and as we have 
changes among these topics. Maybe we'll need to get her back here in February or March if we have, uh, you know, more updates. But thank you all for coming. We appreciate uh, your support. And um, stay dry today and have a happy holiday if we don't talk to you before then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.